Once upon a time in history, a land we now know as northern Iraq, stretching down through Syria and into Turkey, there thrived a great but often forgotten kingdom, the kingdom of Matoni. To its own people, it was Hanagalbat, to the Assyrians, it was known by this name as well, and to the Egyptians, it was Naharin and Metani. In its heyday, between 1500 and 1240 BCE, Matoni was among the world's most powerful nations. While the records of the Matoni people themselves are scarce, glimpses of their existence are preserved in the correspondence between the kings of Matoni and those of Assyria and Egypt, notably in the Amarna letters. Additionally, the world's oldest horse training manual and a treaty between Matoni and the Hittites offer a window into the life of this prosperous nation. Around 1350 BCE, Matoni was influential enough to join the Great Powers Club, an elite group that included Egypt, the Hatti Kingdom, Babylonia, and Assyria. However, in the 14th century BCE, the Assyrians began to encroach on Matoni's territory, and their king, Ashurbanipal I, annexed significant lands. Internal conflicts over succession within Matoni's ruling royalty further weakened the kingdom, making it easy prey for the Hittites under King Sapaluliam I. He conquered Matoni, deported large segments of its population, and replaced them with Hittites. The Assyrian king Adad Na'ari I followed suit, taking control of the region and deporting segments of the population, replacing them with Assyrian subjects. His son and successor, Shalmaneser I, completed the conquest of Matoni around 1250 BCE. Shalmaneser's son, Tukulti Nanata I, vanquished the Hittites at the Battle of Nyria in 1245 BCE, eliminating them as a regional power and absorbing the significantly reduced kingdom of Matoni into the expanding Assyrian Empire. Now, let's delve into the people of Matoni and their identity. The Matoni Kingdom, which flourished between approximately 1475 and 1275 BCE, has been associated with various groups. Some suggest they were migratory Indo-Iranians or Indo-Aryans, while others even link them with the Semitic Hyksos. Yet, the debate about their true ethnicity continues. Scholars have tried to identify their ethnicity based on the names of deities invoked in a treaty with the Hittites. Both Indo-Aryans and Indo-Iranians, who were once part of the same migratory group from Central Asia, revered gods such as Indra, Mithra, and Verena. These deities were shared among both groups, complicating efforts to pin down the Matoni's exact ethnicity. One thing is reasonably clear, the ruling class, known as the Marianyu, gave the kingdom its name Matoni. The Assyrians called it Hanagalbat, and the Hittites referred to the people as the Huri and their territory as the land of the Huri or Hurrians. Most modern scholars tend to agree that the Matoni people were, in fact, Hurrians. The language of the Matoni kingdom was Hurrian, distinct from the Indo-Iranian languages. The ruling elite, however, worshipped deities with Vedic names like Indar, Urawana, and the Devas. Over time, this elite intermarried with the local population, leading to a blending of cultures and beliefs. Matoni's capital, Washukani, was situated at the headwaters of the river Haba, a tributary of the Euphrates. The name Washukani translates to source of good or source of wealth in the Kurdish language. Some scholars speculate that the ancient city of Sikon, located near Gozan in Syria, could be the remains of Washukani. However, due to the scarcity of written records from the Matoni people themselves, discussions about their daily lives and religious beliefs often involve considerable speculation. Nonetheless, it's evident that the kingdom of Matoni was a considerable power in the ancient Near East, leaving its mark on history beginning around 1500 BCE. In the golden days of the Matoni kingdom, their dominion stretched like a mighty river. They held sway over crucial trade routes, which flowed down the Haba to Mari and up the Euphrates to Carchemish. These routes were the lifeblood of commerce, connecting their lands with distant realms. Their allies, such as Kizuwatna in southeastern Anatolia and the Niyar bordering the Orontes River, bolstered their influence. The Matoni even shared their eastern borders with the Hurrian-speaking Kassites, fostering good relations with their neighbors. In this fertile land, agriculture thrived without the need for artificial irrigation. The people of Matoni raised herds of cattle, sheep, horses, and goats, and they were renowned as skilled horsemen and charioteers. They were, in fact, the innovators who pioneered the development of the light war chariot. Unlike the solid wood wheels used by the Sumerians, their chariots boasted wheels with spokes, 
making them faster and more maneuverable. Within the Hittite archives of Hattusa, nestled near present-day Bogus Kale in Turkey, a remarkable discovery was made. It was the world's oldest surviving horse training manual, dating back to 1345 BCE. This manual, authored by a Matoni horse trainer named Kikuli, provided a comprehensive guide on how to properly train horses. It was a testament to the Matoni's mastery of horsemanship. Now, let's journey into the annals of Matoni's history through the lives of its kings. In the early days, much about the Matoni monarchy remains shrouded in the mists of time. However, the names of the early rulers have been preserved in the correspondences they exchanged with neighboring countries. During the 16th century BCE, Kirta, Shatana I, and Bharatana were some of the most prominent kings. Shoshtatar, a later monarch who reigned around 1430 BCE, expanded Matoni's boundaries through the conquest of Alalak, Nutsi, Ozor, and Kizuwatna. However, Egypt, led by Tutmos III, posed a formidable challenge. After a prolonged struggle, the Egyptians ultimately defeated Matoni at Aleppo, gaining control of the region of Syria. Artatama I, who ruled during the time of the Egyptian pharaohs Amenhotep II and Tutmos IV, focused on forging alliances with Egypt through marriages. His efforts set the stage for his son, Shatana II, who orchestrated the marriage of his daughter, Kilu Hepa, to Amenhotep III. This marital alliance strengthened relations between Matoni and Egypt, solidifying Matoni's power and securing its borders. Under Shatana II's reign, Matoni reached the pinnacle of its influence and prestige. It earned a place in what historians call the Great Powers Club, alongside nations like Egypt, Babylonia, and the Hittites. This modern designation represents the most dominant states in the region, bound together by trade and alliances. While treaties and trade agreements have survived from this era and beyond, they provide only fragmented insights into Matoni's political and cultural impact. Unlike other well-documented civilizations, Matoni's interactions with them remain obscured by the sands of time. Intriguingly, Matoni's history is beset by chronology uncertainties, making it a puzzle for scholars. Relying on synchronisms with Egypt and Hatti, Hittites, is often the only way to approximate the reigns of Matoni kings. While certain periods, like the reigns of Shatana II and his son Tushrata, are better documented due to the Amarna letters correspondence, even these glimpses into Matoni's past are far from complete. In the heart of this grand tapestry of history lies the story of King Tushrata, whose daughter, Princess Tadyuhepa, played a pivotal role in the intricate dance of diplomacy. The bonds of two great nations, Matoni and Egypt, were further intertwined through a strategic marriage arrangement. Princess Tadyuhepa, a symbol of this alliance, was wedded to none other than Amenhotep III, the mighty pharaoh of Egypt. This union was no mere happenstance, it was a carefully crafted treaty, a delicate thread in the fabric of political power. While some have attempted to connect Tadyuhepa to the famous Egyptian queen Nefertiti or Akhenaten's lesser wife Kia, such claims are often met with skepticism by scholars. Tushrata, a shrewd diplomat and ruler, went to great lengths to strengthen the bond between these two kingdoms. As a symbol of his goodwill and desire for an enduring alliance, he sent a substantial dowry along with his daughter. Among these treasures was a statue of the patron deity of Washukani, the goddess of fertility, Soska. This divine gift not only sought to alleviate any ailment that ailed Amenhotep III, but also invoked the blessings of a love goddess upon the marriage. A detailed list of these lavish gifts is preserved in the correspondence between the two monarchs. It included the glittering allure of gold, opulent horse saddles adorned with opulent designs, camel litters fit for royalty, exquisite jewelry, and sumptuous clothing. Yet, the strength of this treaty would soon face its first tests. The first challenge emerged when Tushrata expressed his dissatisfaction with the amount of gold received from Egypt as part of the marriage transaction. But this initial hiccup was but a prelude to a more significant trial. A power struggle erupted within Tushrata's own city, Washukani. A relative, possibly his brother, known as Artatama II, sought to seize authority. In this contest for power, Egypt cast its support behind Tushrata, while the Hittite king, Sapaluliama I, championed the cause of Artatama II. The Hittites, seeking to break the Matoni stranglehold on trade routes, orchestrated Artatama II's coup. Yet, it soon became evident that Tushrata had the support of his loyal nobles and, crucially, 
the might of Egypt, victory seemed within his grasp. However, the shifting sands of politics would soon alter the course of this conflict. Fearing the surging power of the Hittites, Egypt withdrew its support, leaving Tushrata vulnerable. Seizing the opportunity, Supaluliama I, free from diplomatic constraints, led his forces to besiege Washukani. The once mighty city fell, and Tushrata met his tragic end, perhaps at the hands of his own son, in a desperate bid to save their city. Following this conquest, Mutoni was ruled as a vassal state by the Hittites, who appointed puppet kings to advance their agenda. But the winds of fate would not remain still for long. The annals of history reveal the steady march of the Assyrians, as they gradually tightened their grip on Mutoni. The exact timing of this transition remains uncertain, but it likely occurred during the reign of Hittite King Merzili II or even earlier. The decisive battle of Nairiva in 1245 BCE, which marked the decline of the Hittite Empire, witnessed the complete absorption of Mutoni into the Assyrian fold. As the dust settled, the great kingdom of Mutoni faded into obscurity, becoming little more than a distant echo of a once mighty realm. Its memory was preserved only through scarce surviving documents and artifacts, such as the enigmatic cylinder seals bearing the mark of Mutoni. Even today, as scholars labor to piece together the fragments of its history, the kingdom of Mutoni remains a shadowy enigma. Its complete obliteration by the Assyrians has left historians with an enduring mystery, one that persists despite the progress of time and the revelations of archaeology. Thus, Mutoni, a fleeting yet significant power of the ancient world, continues to elude our full understanding.